Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. On Friday, I performed a funeral for a gentleman by the name of Elder Art. I've never met Elder. In fact, he, uh, he had not lived in the valley for, well, I believe, almost 10 years. But his, his daughter, Linda, called me and we talked. And she told me a little about him, but she actually told me the one thing needful, or as Christ might have said, the one thing necessary. That Elder was baptized that he was a Christian, and that he held to the faith, to the Word of God, that one thing that is necessary. He clung to the Word in the water and the faith that clings to that Word. And even though I didn't know him, there will come a day when I will know him and he shall know me, and we shall fully know one another, even as we are fully known. And that day, that day comes on the day of our Lord Christ Jesus, when the resurrection of all flesh will take place, that all the dead will be raised, and the Christian will enjoy a wonderful and blessed reunion within himself or herself of a body that is now made glorious like the glorious body of Christ and a soul now cleansed from every stain of original sin and a wonderful blessed reunion outside ourselves where we shall know and be fully known all the saints of the church triumphant, the church that rests from her labor. And All Saints Day is set aside in the church to commemorate our brothers and sisters who have died in the last year and who have remained faithful, faithful unto death and received the crown of life. They now rest from their labors and await that resurrection, that resurrection on the day of Christ Jesus. They are the church triumphant. They are those who rest in peace, for their life, their life is not ended. But for those of us who remain, those of us who, yes, are saints, and yes, are still sinners, we here are members of what is called the church militant because well, we still fight against the passions of the flesh which wage war against our soul. And so we are militant because we still fight that good fight. And it is to you, dear saints of the church militant, that Christ speaks the Beatitudes, quite literally, the blessings. Now, too often we see these and we hear them and think of them as, as attitudes that we must do, attitudes that we must be. And actually, that is wrong-headed because these attitudes are not what you must be, but these are attitudes of your very being, attitudes of who you are. They're blessings, blessings that the Christian has now and blessings that will be made more full, more full in the kingdom that is to come. And so let's look at these blessings, these beatitudes, or if you will, these attitudes of your being. Our Lord says first, blessed are the poor in spirit. There are some Sundays 
when I feel especially poor in the Spirit, when I feel that my faith is weak, the doubts are a little stronger in the ear. But that's not the kind of poverty that our Lord is speaking about. Instead, to be poor in spirit is to recognize that you lack, that you are destitute of the things needful in the spirit, that you are without what you need in the spiritual realm. And that, brothers and sisters, is the function of the law that shows us our sin and our complete and desperate need for the Savior complete and desperate need for the spiritual thing. Blessed are those who mourn. And though on, on All Saints Day we may think back to our brothers and sisters in the faith that have gone away from us, we might think of that kind of mourning. But again, that is not the kind of mourning that Christ is speaking about our being. For having recognized our poverty of spirit, having been crushed by the law, and recognizing our need for the Savior, we mourn, we grieve that there are yet still evil things in the world, evil things within us, that we are still beset by the devil and his tactics. Blessed are the meek. Again, not an active work, not an idea of one who of themselves makes the choice to be humble and lowly. But it's a passive condition. It's a disposition of the spirit that turns from the self, that turns from reliance on our strength, on our character, on our will, and accepts how God deals with us, how He disciplines us, how He comforts us, how He blesses us. And it accepts God's work within us without dissent, without resistance. For the meek are those who rely on God and not on themselves. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And do you feel it? Brothers and sisters, do you feel that hunger and that thirst? That's the call of the Holy Spirit within you. For having been crushed by the law, to recognize your sin, to know in every fiber of your being that you are a lost and condemned person, you yearn for salvation. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. You hunger and thirst for Christ, who is the very righteousness of God. Blessed are the merciful. Even though this is constructed much as the other Beatitudes of a sort of this and then, a cause and result kind of situation, in this case, it's almost a result, cause, result. For brothers and sisters, you have been shown mercy. Not only a simple kindness, but an earth-shattering, universe-changing mercy that redeems you from death, that gives you new life. And having received this mercy, having been made a Christian, you cannot help but to reflect that mercy, to be and embody that mercy, to show mercy, for you have already been shown mercy. 
And yet those mercies are new each day. And though shown mercy, God continues to show mercy and to shower his blessings upon you. Blessed are the pure in heart. See, the heart of the Christian is being renewed each and every day. It's the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, His continuous work of sanctification. The psalmist speaks of, of he who has clean hands and a pure heart. For he who has clean hands and a pure heart is the one who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He does not turn to idols. He does not swear by God with unbelief or even with the intention to deceive. He is faithful and true who knows that there is but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God to whom he looks for all mercy, one God by whose name he knows he lives. And having a pure heart, having a clean heart and a right spirit, as we might say, is to be in right standing before God to be engaged in love for God and love for our neighbor. And to those pure in heart, they shall see God. And so indeed you do. Here and now with the eyes of faith, you behold him here in the word, the word that was read and spoken today his word that is preached to you to this day. And you behold him there in the font where his word and the water were joined to wash you, to clean you, to make you Christian. And you will behold him also there at the altar at the table of the Lord, where with the eyes of flesh you might yet see bread and wine, but also with the eyes of faith you see the true body and most precious blood of Christ, a true and physical presence of God, present in every way. Blessed are the peacemakers, For just as the peace of God is not like the peace of the world, so also the peacemakers of God are not like the peacemakers of the world or the diplomats of our nation that through negotiation, through possibly genuine or disingenuous smiles, fancy words or crafty language, settle disputes for a time, Lay aside weapons for a time. Now the peace of God is not the mere absence of war or conflict. The peace of God is Christ Jesus himself who has made peace by his death. The peace of God is the kingdom that draws near the kingdom in which he sits upon the throne. And even before his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, in the sending of the 72, Christ commanded them to be peacemakers, saying, whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, if one who believed in the Messiah, in the Christ, God's promise of redemption, then your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you. And that 
brothers and sisters, is what a peacemaker of God is and does. Peacemakers proclaim and announce the kingdom of God, the peace that we have in Christ Jesus, that is a real, tangible, present reality, even for those who disbelieve. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The world abhors holy living. It derides the law of God as stuffy, judgmental, even antiquated, for another time, but not for now. And when you abide by God's law, you are often ridiculed, were made fun of and pressured to conform to, to the standards of our culture, the practices of the land. And while we might be tempted to think of this as the kind of persecution, again, that's not the persecution for which Christ is speaking here. For the righteousness that Christ is talking about is himself. He is the righteousness of God, as we have already seen. And it is on account of being His disciples, of being Christian, that persecution comes. And that is perhaps why the last beatitude is not spoken broadly of those, but it is spoken you. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. I recall that in the epistle of First John, he says, the reason that the world does not know us, the reason the world does not know Christians it's because the world did not know him. And though the persecutors of this world may point to behavior as the reason for their violence, it is actually their rejection of Christ that drives them. Because not knowing him, they remain in the kingdom of the prince of the air. They remain slaves under the rule of Satan. And that enmity which, is, which was foretold, which was promised, that enmity between the seed of woman and the serpent remains between the Christian and those in the fallen world. But brothers and sisters, you know Christ, and He knows you. And this is God's promise, that the kingdom of heaven is yours, that you are comforted, that you will inherit the earth, not a disembodied heaven of, of harps and wings, but a real, present, renewed, new heaven and earth. You will be satisfied in the yearnings for righteousness. As you are satisfied now, you will yet be satisfied more. And the mercies that are new each day will hold nothing in comparison to the mercies in the new heaven and earth. You are yet called sons of God, but you will know Him fully and see God face to face, even as you are fully known. These blessings are yours, and as wonderful as, as they are, your reward great in heaven 
The reward here is still, well, quite good. For the blessings are given to strengthen you, to support you, to uphold you in that war against the sinful flesh. In your work as the church militant. And today we will rejoice in the victory of the Lord and come forth to his table to receive his body and his blood, the forgiveness of sins and the strengthening of faith. But on this day there is a, an aspect of Holy Communion that, that I don't want you to overlook today. For yes, communion is a very personal thing, but it is never private. And I want you to understand how not private it is. For when we come to the altar, we confess that we are of one faith, that we believe the teachings of the apostles. And we stand there not simply as ourselves, and not only with our brothers and sisters to our left and our right. We stand with the great cloud of witnesses. We stand at this altar reunited in a very real way with our brothers and sisters, our mothers, fathers, grandparents, children who have died in the faith. They are present there with us. And though we miss them here, this side of glory, take comfort. For when you stand at this altar to receive the body and blood of Christ, it is a foretaste of that feast, that heavenly banquet that our brothers and sisters in the church triumphant are partaking of. And they partake it with you. And so each Sunday, each Sunday is a very blessed reunion with all the saints, with those who are parted from us, those we have never known, but those we look forward to knowing and by whom we shall also be fully known. Rejoice, brothers and sisters. Rejoice, for this is the family meal, and happy are those called to his supper. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.